should not be confused with measurement. However, the concern of the quantum, me of the quantum measure approach is also quantum measurement and the quantum measurement problems, which is why uh, we thought this would be an appropriate place to review, a time to review the basic questions that lead us to look for alternative approaches to quantum mechanics. Thank you, Shumati, and uh, thank you for inviting me to this meeting and last two days I heard very instructive talks and it was an education for me. And to, to be honest, I was not so interested about quantum measure theory. I didn't know sufficient enough to. But the last two talks convinced me about one point about its internal rigidity and the care with which it is formulated. And above all, some of the critical issues in quantum mechanics like contextuality, although the word contextuality may not like, but here I shall put it that way. This is, each person has his own or her way of looking at the foundational issue. So, and also it is particularly relevant that towards the end of the discussion, just before lunch, Raphael mentioned the quantum measurement problem. So that is a perfect prelude to my talk. And why, first of all, I want to emphasize all these discussions about quantum measure theory or other approaches which were also mentioned during Raphael's talk, like Bohm model or collapse model and decoherence. From a pure pragmatic point of view or operational point of view, one may say quantum mechanics is such an amazingly successful theory. And so why should one bother about going beyond the usual framework in terms of wave functions, operators, that is sufficient, that a perfect good calculation and recipes. And that a point that Sadiq was mentioning. And I'm, it is, I'm, it's unfortunate he's not there today. So I, I was trying to convince people like him and others, many others, that what is the need for going beyond, or thinking beyond the standard framework? And for that, some of us, not the majority necessarily, working on foundational issues, believe that the quantum measurement problem is the central reason why one sh should go beyond the standard framework without worrying about aesthetic points that, that are always debatable, the points that those points that I am also full agreement with, but points which Raphael and Sumati were repeatedly stretching, stressing, there are questions that are prohibited to be asked in the standard framework that these alternative approaches can answer, or one tries to understand in a deeper way the quantum phenomena, what's going on between the emission of a particle and detection of a particle, taking into account the whole setup. But still one can argue about all these, that these are all aesthetic considerations or subjective. But quantum measure problem, what we believe is a genuine, logically uh, compelling, provides a logically compelling argument for going beyond the standard. So that will be the, my main aim of today's talk. And so first I will try to explain what is the quantum measurement problem and why is the problem important. In fact, these two are very important. And so I shall go about it slowly, but before that, to set the stage, I shall have to make some preliminary remarks about what, how, 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 it, when, how measurement is described in quantum theory, and to set up the problem. And, and then I come to the, this point, inadequacies of the standard resolutions. Now what I mean by standard resolution is, of course, what is popularly referred to as Copenhagen framework, but Copenhagen framework is not a single well-defined rigid framework, there are many versions of it. But I will not go into those subtleties, I will make some broad remarks and point, uh, discuss the inadequacies and also about some stand, much discussed or non-orthodox approaches. When I use that qualification, much discussed, because there are many non-orthodox approaches being proposed, and but there are some which are more, more popularly talked about than others. It's more popularly means are more talked about, and I shall choose. And, I shall, and my remarks will be restricted to those non-orthodox approaches. For example, quantum measure theory. I just came to educate myself, so I cannot make any remark how quantum measure theory would stand in relation to the quantum measure problem. But I'm glad that already Rafael referred to a quantum measure problem as one of the motivations why, for example, that multiplicative scheme is justified in particular. Measure, measure theory. 
And what uh, has been also my recurrent theme in my studies on quantum formation over the last two or three decades, we, I and my collaborators have been always trying to link the foundational issues with the actual experiments. That has been the thrust of the work. And we have been work. So along that line, I shall try to emphasize how some of the crucial aspects of quantum measurement, like what I call superposition of macroscopically distinct states of the macro system, contextually in invasiveness, are being available to experiment. So even if there are people who don't agree about the first three parts of the measurement problem and are not convinced, for them, there will be some interesting, new, interesting aspects of physics involved here, and they are related to some possible experimental tests, some of them already being done or being planned. But this is a very ambitious plan, so let me see how much I can cover. But of, of course, I'm here around for the week, so I'll skip many details. So whoever wants to discuss more, I can fill in. So the mind, I will be only indicating the essential conceptual elements and the main points. Let me begin. So even a very pragmatic physicist like Stephen Weinberg had conceded in his book with dreams of a final theory that quantum measurement problem is the most important puzzle in the interpretation of quantum mechanics. But that book was written in 1987. And interestingly, Weinberg has recently published his lectures on quantum mechanics. And there, although his main point remains the same, the quantum measurement problem is the important, he no, he no longer considers it to be a puzzle. So this shows that how viewpoint on quantum measurement problem can evolve over time for even a person like Weinberg. So it's a very tricky problem. So, so let me leave it. Since, since the term realism has been used and reality in this meeting very often, and as some philosopher Fair event that remarked, theory always puts a mask in the face of reality. So what, it, what you mean by reality is always in the context of some, some theoretical framework one or some understanding one has in mind. So here I shall be using what I shall refer to as classical realism, mainly that is characterized by just some of the basic notions that are found to be applicable or workable in the macroscopic world. Like all the physical attributes have definite values associated with them at any instant of time, irrespective of measurement. And measured values of observables are the same as pre-measured values. And also that it is possible to describe the causal change in the values of the physical attributes of an individual object. That part you all already know. But here only one point I would like to stress that even if you take an example such as a crossed point, they seem to have indefinite attributes during the period of the motion. But a classical realist would refer to what is known as the counterfactual assertion that with sufficient precise knowledge of the relevant initial conditions, these properties can be predicted or known as accurate realism once. So this counterfactual statement is also at the core of classical <coughs> realism. And it does not lead to any incompatibility with the laws of classical physics. So this point is useful to remember, often not stressed. Now in standard, by quantum mechanics I mean and my, and my whole discussion will be within the standard, in the usual framework of quantum mechanics, because last two days we have been hearing lectures looking at quantum mechanics in terms of different theoretical framework, but the my lecture is based on the usual idea, description of quantum mechanics in terms of wave functions and operators and inverse space and non commutative So looked at from that point of view, one can, what is usually asserted in the standard framework that the unobserved dynamical variables reality cannot be ascribed. But that does not mean that it denies the existence of the entities. They are characterized by the static innate attributes. And also that it is not possible to determine the state of a quantum system without affecting the system during its time evolution. So already you see that in the usual statement, there is a qualitative distinction between what we may refer to as microscopic and macroscopic levels of reality. So and without going into the content of the measurement problem, one can see that 
the, st the standard interpretation of quantum mechanics has this essential dichotomy inherent in it. And what is not also emphasized that it is not, an, it is not just that it has the dichotomy, but it also does not address the central problem as to how and what stage it becomes converted into a classical quantum factor. This is an <coughs> important point to, to remember that, okay, the dichotomy in itself wouldn't have been, wouldn't have been that uh, uh, problematic if one could specify how it, the quantum description gets converted into a classical one. So it is the very legitimacy of the cut is an issue if one believes that quantum mechanics is a universal theory. And if one believes quantum mechanics is a universal theory, one is prima facie extra, entitled to extrapolate it to the scale of the macro world. And it is that such an extrapolation leads to an incompatibility, a conceptual incompatibility with the notion of realism at the macro level is at the heart of <coughs> so, what do you mean by the cut? Pardon? What do you mean by the That is a good question. I'll come to that. In fact, this is first. The cut means the, the, the level at which you may say that the classical realism is experientially observed. Means our experience is compatible with that notion of realism at the level of usual macroscopic objects. Like, for example, at the level of, say, but at what precise level that classical notion of realism op operates, that is not specified. That is the weakness of the standard frame. You say that, okay, the quantum becomes classical at a limit h tending to zero, or large n, or see, it varies from system to system, or context to context. But the very qualitative notion of realism that we have, and, that, and why this cut problem is important, I'm trying to come to the, the, the measurement problem. This macro <coughs> I will explain <coughs> this in relation to the mission. This macro realism is not the same as the Legger card. Uh, I have not come here to that. I have not used the word Legger card. No. This is a general statement. This is, this is a general statement of realism as it is understood in a very um, simplified way. This is, the, this is a general what we need, what a classical realist a person who has been educated by classical mechanics throughout and whose observed world is consistent with classical objects. And that is what at the macro scale. Now there are all those questions, what you mean by macro scale, at what level. So what I am first saying that uh, we have roughly this idea of macro realism and classical realism, also the idea of micro realism. Now if you stick to the standard framework, there is no scope for addressing this problem. And if you are just an operationalist or so on, I believe, so this problem you cannot address in any way. So you would be entitled to believe that quantum mechanics is okay, a universal theory. So in principle, it should be applicable at any level. Okay. So this I will skip to all of you know the basics of that. Now, the crucial point is that in the wave function description, because that is also an important for understanding measurement problem. That psi, we already, it has been talked about that this complex, shy being complex is a fundamental element of quantum theory. And what is important is that the argument of psi contains this function, so if you are right, psi is a one-dimensional wave function, typical with the position coordinate. But this x occurring here is an argument of a complex function. So it is not an act, it is not a physical x physical quantity. So, so, so directly measurable quantities do not occur in the fundamental element of the theory. Whereas in the classical mechanics, when you write the classical equation of motion, these are directly observable quantities which occur there. Are you saying that x is not directly observable? Yes, in, in the standard quantum mechanics, it's a complex function, the arguments and x. So how or what we mean by measuring x, what we mean by measuring that x, that first of all, when you set up the apparatus of standard quantum mechanics, you write psi and its time evolution. Now that is entirely a deterministic evolution, governed by a partial differential equation, fine. But then how you relate psi 
to the actual observable quantities, you need some interpretation analysis. That is what is supplied by the so-called uh, Dirac bond rule for calculating the probabilities of outcomes of measurements. So the point is that the equation of motion is not an enough in the standard framework of the wave function. That is because wave function in itself is an abstract quantity. And its arguments are all in that abstract configuration space. Now, actual measurements experiments are done in the real space time. So, how do you relate the actual measured values to that quantity psi? For that, you postulate some extra rules in addition to the Schrodinger equation. That is how the standard framework is. So, that rule already is an interpretational aspect introduced in the theory. And also, by definition, then, that predictions are verifiable only on an ensemble corresponding to a given wave function inside. And what is this? You asserted that the values of dynamical variable acquire objective reality only by measure. So this is all the standard framework. But now I come to an, another important point in the standard framework which is particularly relevant for the statement of the quantum measurement problem. So far it's fine, it's a general statement that the system does not have a well-defined property when it is not observed, but there is an important point there, the concept of pure state vis-a-vis -vis mixed state in standard framework. Suppose one considers a typical case, a spin half particle, considered in a superposition of spin up and spin down state, say in the Z basis. So that means it, is, it has a definite x polarized. So if, a part, if there is an ensemble of systems prepared in the wave function side and you make measurements of spin Z, it is up or down, you get 50% probability and that is according to the bond Dirac rule and so on. So there you predict experimental outcomes. Now one may say that since on that ensemble by making measurements of sigma Z, I get either plus one and minus one. Suppose I make the assumption that before my measurement, the system had those values plus z and minus. Now in quantum mechanics, if you have an ensemble with systems having well-defined property values like say plus z and minus z, then it is described as a mixed state. It is described as a mixed state where each member of that ensemble has either spin plus z or minus z. So it is or, I have put this symbol here to distinguish emphasize the fact that it is a mixture and this is superposition. That means it is here and and this is or. Now the interpretation of pure and mixed state is different in standard framework of quantum mechanics. This is a crucial point. From the point of view of the mixed state description, the system is in either one state or the other. But when the ensemble is in a pure state, you cannot interpret to be either this or that. Easily one can say, they see that if one interprets it in that way, this superposition and this mixture are not equivalent if you measure any other property of sigma, say x, sigma x, then the probability of getting plus one is equal to one for this ensemble, whereas it is half for this ensemble. So, so what I want to emphasize of a common point, but this is important to this will be important soon, almost an elementary point, that a pure state. So it is fundamental to the standard framework that a pure state is not equivalent to a mixed state. It may be equivalent with respect to certain measurements of dynamical variables, but not for all. For example, with respect to sigma z measurement, it is equivalent, but not with respect to sigma x measurement. So you are not entitled to interpret any superposition, an ensemble of systems in a psi, which is a superposition of sets. So <laughs> The superposition of states of certain dynamical variable, we interpret that the each member of that ensemble is in this state or that state, I can say. Okay, so now I come to the measurement part. So, what is a measurement interaction? Now, the crucial part of measurement is that the notion of measurement outcome. So, measurement interaction in general 
can be called to be a correlation that any interaction that sets up a correlation between an observable of the measure system and an appropriate indicator variable, say the position of pointer of a measure. Say you think of any typical measurement, that is what happens. And um, what we mean by a measurement outcome is the value of the indicator variable at the end of the measure. If you look at the position of the meter needle, so you will see that some kind of displacement and you infer the value of the observer. So it is such a correlation that is a necessary condition, but not sufficient in the time space. So you set up a correlation that is the first stage in the measurement between the observable of the measured system and the indicator variable. So, uh, uh, just to give you an idea, something concrete, if you did if the initial wave function of the measured system is psi 0 and this apparatus is represented by phi 0. So, here in the quantum description of measurement process, both system and apparatus are treated on an equal field. So, if one goes about that way, then by modeling the interaction Hamiltonian appropriately, where G is the coupling strength and A is the dynamical variable that is being measured, and suppose the meter coordinate is the position of the apparatus, the meter level, it's in a one dimensional case. So, then one, one can show that with this interaction Hamiltonian and with the initial wave function, the wave function of the observed system and wave function of the measuring apparatus, the final combined wave function, and that was what von Neumann first pointed out in his famous book, Quantum Theory of Measurement, and his famous chapter on measurement theory in his book on quantum mechanics in 1932, was that the final uh, wave function, the combined wave function, is a non factorizable wave function, and that is an entangled wave function between the observed system and the apparatus. Often, and this is what is popularly referred to as the entanglement, word was coined by Schrodinger and it was used by Schrodinger and Schrodinger in his 1935 paper brought out the measurement problem in a very, very elegant way and also the EPR problem. But von Neumann already in 1932 book in his chapter on measurement theory has had emphasized the point that it is the measurement interaction already that produces this non-factorizability that is, that is now referred to as entanglement in the system. But the important point is that this is essentially a pure state, a pure state, combined state of the system plus apparatus. And von Neumann himself modeled it more specifically by taking a specific gender function model for the coupling strength and also the position variable x which has been measured and so on. But, uh, but then but the important point it illustrates that model and also other descriptions of other, if you consider for example Sterngardler. Sterngardler you have the spin measurement, but it is ultimately the position of the particle which is being registered. So it is the coupling between the spin and the position. So the Sterngardler interaction what it produces, so I am not displaying those slides where you can explicitly see and that is instructive that it is the spin position entanglement which is produced. And that needs to, that that is a necessary condition for the measurement process to occur. But that by in itself is not a measurement, as you can see in Sterngarten. After the particle has emerged from the magnet, you have to register it on the screen. So there is a detecting device which is necessary after this stage. So that entanglement is between just the system and the apparatus, it is still in a pure state. So that is what I here in a schematic way, say psi 0 is the superposition of eigenstates of the measured variable and then whatever way you model the measurement process in, and, and in quantum theory of measurements there are, there are quite a considerable number of examples worked out thoroughly and rigorously for different kinds of measurement situations. But all those measurement situations have this common characteristic that if you start with the initial state of the measure state system of this form and then the final combined state after a measurement interaction will be of this form. And where this phi 1 and phi 2 are, are asserted to be 
macroscopically distinguishable states. That is where crudely the notion of macro realism, classical realism is invoked to, to explain the objective reality of the measurement outcome. Earlier I showed that any crucial upshot of the measurement process is the measurement outcome. But now what we mean by measurement outcome is that there is some property of the apparatus, say the position of the meter middle, that is being registered. Say in the standard lab, it is the position of the particle registered on the screen. But the quantum mechanical description can come up to this stage where you have the interaction between the system and the apparatus. Like in the standard lab, it is the position of the particle and the spin. So position of the particle is acting as an apparatus, but still at this stage, the measurement is not completed. It is still a pure state, a non-factorizable entangled state, but it is a pure state. So the, all the ensembles are described at the same side. And as I emphasize that in a pure state, you cannot imagine that the system is, and this is a linear superposition of these two terms. So you cannot interpret this according to the rule in which a pure state is interpreted in quantum mechanics as a system being in either psi 1 or psi it is in still in a superposition. So you, you infer the measurement outcome by looking at the property of the apparatus. So the apparatus itself is also in, in, in combination with wave function. So you, there are two aspects of this form of wave function. One, you cannot assign an independent wave function to the measuring apparatus because of this entangled nature. And secondly, you cannot infer that the apparatus after this measurement interaction is in either phi 1 or phi 2, because the meaning of pure state doesn't entitle you to do so. And also that notion of entanglement means that you cannot ascribe an independent state or description to the apparatus. But our very process of measurement, inferring the measurement outcome, essentially depends on noting the change in the state of the apparatus or noting the uh, how that particular property of the apparatus has changed. For example, how the position of the meter needle has shifted. So you just look at the property of the apparatus and how it has changed to infer the measurement outcome. And the measurement outcome has an objective reality in the sense that it's intersubjective. Anyone can look at it and get the same result without disturbing that position of the meter needle. So that one, all these things we take it to be obvious, but these are the essential ingredients of the measurement process. Uh, intersubjectivity, stability of the outcome that is being recorded as a discernible property of the macro apparatus. So that means you are as assigning some objective reality to the apparatus itself after the measurement process and its property exists independent of whether one looks at it or not. And it can be observed, the property can be recorded without disturbing it so that all observers noting that position will get the same result. So the stability, so that is what is referred to as the stability, discernibility of the measurement outcome. And this is what I have so Pan Diamond's uh, theory, Pan Diamond's measurement theory, was it motivated by something like a classical realist's point of view, where we do have something like distinguishability taken for granted mm -hmm. in classical realm? That is an interesting question. I, Historically, it is interesting that after Dirac's book came, was published before Van Diemen. And the way Dirac put it, if you read that famous statement of Dirac where he introduces it to that, Dirac recognized that Schrodinger wave equation is not the whole story, and even Schrodinger wave equation plus Bond Dirac rule is not the whole story. Or, or by the way, I'm referring to this as Bond Dirac rule because Bond's original rule was restricted for psi mod square and what is usually used for superposition is more Dirac introduced in his book. But when he introduced that rule, he, he recognized this. That's why when he introduces the notion of measurement, he uses that famous phrase that a measurement introduces an uncontrollable disturbance of the system so that the system jumps from the state to the eigenstate of the observable that is being measured. And that was how we were also taught. Now this statement that the system jumps to the to the eigenstate of a particular observable. It's a useful way of looking at things. But you see here, the interaction already has used the term interaction. Now in quantum mechanics, whenever two systems interact in that way, they get coupled so that even after the interaction is switched off, they remain entangled. So you cannot make any statement henceforth 
referring to one of them alone. But deluxe debt assertion just refers to the system making the jump. So you are ignoring the apparatus part after the interaction by fear. That point von Neumann realized. If you read this last chapter, it's a beautiful chapter. All this book is notorious for its mathematical, difficult, unfortunately. But the last chapter on quantum theory of measurement. So he takes out from that Dirac. He doesn't mention that explicitly, but it is implied there. So there he emphasizes that well, the non factorizing linear diagram. And that I find very profound because they're not often appreciated that before short, uh, and that was before EPR paper in 1995. So he didn't use the term in diagram. And von Neumann, very few people read that book properly.